Last week we surveyed the glorious temple that Solomon built. It was just a splendid temple. The sanctuary on the inside was totally coated with gold. Uh, gold altar. I mean, it was just a beautiful, beautiful temple. And we, we went through that and kind of related it to our history of where we're at uh, here at Bethany Church. However, that glorious temple didn't last. It was destroyed in 586. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, saw it as a prize. In 605, he came and he sacked Jerusalem, but he didn't destroy the temple. <clears throat> and then Israelites still got a little arrogant, and so he came back a second time in 586. This time he destroyed the temple. He took all the gold out of it. He took all the vessels that they used in the temple and he carried them off into Babylon. <clears throat> Israel itself was taken Babylon. Just a very tiny remnant still remained in the city, but uh, they were in years of captivity. Jeremiah had predicted it. Jeremiah had said that there would be 70 years of captivity if they did not repent. They did not repent. They persisted in their idolatry and so they were they were subjugated to domination by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar the king. <clears throat> now we are going 48 years later. The year is 538 BC. <clears throat> the Babylonians have been conquered by the Persians and uh, Cyrus is the king of Persia and he's very friendly to the Israelites. In fact, he issues a decree that they can go back to their land and they can rebuild their temple. And so the captives returned uh, somewhere between 538 and 536 B.C. <clears throat> and uh, they're back for the sole purpose that he has been decreed that they can rebuild the temple. So today's message, as we look at the book of Haggai, chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us in the second year of, Dar of Darius the king. <clears throat> now Darius was the successor to Cyrus. And so we know the year of this is the year 520 B.C. It's 18 years later or 66 years after the destruction of, Jer of Jerusalem and the temple. So it says in the, the verse here, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. This passage is going to be so appropriate for us. And the reason I say that is because in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says this, these things happen to them, the things of the Old Testament. It happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. <clears throat> what he's saying are those of us who live in the modern times, New Times, the New Testament times, everything in the Old Testament was written for our learning and our understanding and to warn us what they did and what happened to them can happen to you. With that, I think it's really important that we continue in the book. First thing I notice about this book is he says, consider your ways. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a little thing going on here in my throat. <clears throat> consider your ways. Those of you who are filling out your blanks, this is probably the first one that you have. Consider your ways. You see, this is the heart of the message. Haggai, the prophet, is preaching and the King James Version in verse 1, verse, uh, verse 5 of, verse of chapter 1 <clears throat> says this, Consider your ways. The New International Version runs, renders it this way, Give careful thought to your ways. The New Living Translation puts it like this, Look what's happening to you. <laughs> That's pretty relevant, isn't it? Look what's happening to you. Are you I, do you see what's happening to you? You probably don't know the DLH version. <clears throat> Those are my initials. <laughs> <clears throat> when I read the Hebrew text, I tried to translate it as literal as I possibly could. It says, set your heart on your way. <clears throat> Connect your heart with where you're going. Your way is your path. It's the road you're on. Connect your heart with where you're going. So you've got to look where you're at. And then you reflect on your own heart. Where's your heart in all of this? <clears throat> that is the heart of this message. No matter which translation you use here, <clears throat> it's about self-examination. You have to examine your own heart. That's Haggai's message. Don't worry about the person sitting next to you. 
often somebody will leave the service and they'll say to me, man, I sure wish so-and-so would have been here to hear that. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, the right so-and-so is right here in front of me. <laughs> you were here to hear that. <clears throat> it's not about the people around us. It's about us. Do a self-examination. <clears throat> he continues by saying, consider your circumstances. Consider your circumstances. What were their circumstances? Here we go. He says, you have planted much, all right, but you have harvested little. Now, you ever feel like that? The harder I work, the behinder I get? Or am I the only one? Yeah, you know it, that's happened to you too. He says, you drink, but you have no, but, but you, you never have your fill. <laughs> this happens all the time. People say to me, I am so bored. Life is so monotonous. I, I just, I'm just never satisfied. And, and it's true. You can get the bigger car, the nicer car, the new car, new clothes, new house, and all of that. And as soon as you've got it done, pretty soon it's just the same old, same old stuff. And you say, I'm just not fulfilled. Life is empty. That's what's happening. You eat. Yeah, I do my share of that. He says, but you never have enough. It's like that, that burger just doesn't satisfy. <laughs> I know they've been downsizing everything. Have you seen a half a gallon of ice cream anymore? Somebody's cheating and fudging there. It's not a half a gallon anymore. You, you get what I'm saying? He's saying, listen, everything you do, you feel like you're spinning your wheels. That's what he's saying. In every area of life. You put on clothes. And what's he say? But you're not warm. Nothing seems to be going right. That's what he's saying. All right, this one we all know. You earn your wages only to put them in a purse that has a hole in it. <laughs> I'm walking through the, uh, the halls here the other day and I look back and there's a stream of change on the floor. I check my pocket. Sure enough, I had a hole in it. That's exactly what he was saying. Listen, you, you work like crazy and you think you got enough and then it's gone. Has anybody been following the stock market lately? No, don't look. They say, don't look. We all want to look when it's on its rise up. But man, it has been so volatile. Do you realize at any moment it'd be crash and be gone? But good. He says, consider what's happening. Consider, he said, but it's your life. He said, don't, don't worry about mine, it's yours. Put your heart on what's happening in your life. And then he says, listen, I want you to consider your place. You know, we all need to be in our proper place. Consider the preacher. This message isn't just for the people. This message is just for the preacher as well. Well, I'm telling you to consider your heart. I've got to consider my heart. A preacher, he says... The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. This is also, uh, this message is for the secular leaders. And to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah. He's the governor. You could put here the politician. Boy, do our politicians need to consider what's really going on. Amen? I mean, I don't care what political party you're with, or none at all. The word of the Lord came to the, to the preacher and comes also to the political leaders and also to the religious leaders, to Joshua. Now this is not Joshua that you always think of uh, as uh, in the, the book of Joshua. Joshua is a, a, a popular name. There were a lot of Joshuas. This Joshua is not the leader of Israel that followed Moses. This Joshua is the high priest. He's the son of Jehozadak. Now this Joshua, you see, the word Joshua translated in the New Testament is Jesus. If you were to say Jesus in Hebrew, you'd say Joshua. <laughs> All right? And so this is a popular name. Joshua, though, is the high priest. It is the job of the high priest to bring people to God. That's his job. He's a religious leader. 
Everybody has their place. You're in here somewhere because he's going to go on and he says, and this is what the Almighty Lord says, these people. So if you're not a, a secular leader, religious leader, you're not a preacher, you are one of the people in this message. Everybody is included in this message. But you need to know your place. He says, these people. And he says, now I want you to consider your speech. Because that's what the text goes on to say. In verse 2, I'm kind of jumping around in the text. So if you've got your Bible open, you notice, hey, he's not taking these in order. Yes, I'm not. He says, these people say, you see, what you say matters. Words can be healing and words can be killer. What you say, the old thing, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is nothing but lies. Words hurt. Words can be healing. He says, what you say matters. He says, these people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. The Lord's house. Solomon's temple. It lay in ruins. It was destroyed. They've been back now for several years. Like 18 years. And the Lord's house was still in ruins. If you were to go back to the book of Ezra, you would find out why. Part of it was they were getting opposition from the older people, and they were getting opposition from the Samaritans. There was opposition to doing the Lord's will to rebuild the temple. The house lay in ruins. Now, I know what some of you are thinking here. I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phew. We've got a building, and it's not in ruins. How does any of this apply to us in our centennial year? Oh, my goodness, God has blessed us. This building, even though it's 30 years old, it's in really good shape. I mean, we've got a building. Yes, we do. But we need to fill it. The Lord is really not about acquiring land. All the land on the planet belongs to Him anyway. The Lord is really not about big buildings. That's not what it's about. The church is not the building. The building holds the church, we the people. It's time to fill it. It's time to fill it. So he says, consider your time. I mean, I mean just that, let me just go back for a moment. Just think about filling it. If you look around, some of you say, well, you know, Pastor, we've probably got as twice as many people as we had probably about four or five years ago. We've probably twice as many people come now. But look around. There's still a lot of empty seats. Think about this for a moment. Think about it. If everybody here invited somebody and they came next week, we'd have twice as many, right? Wow. And you say, well, pretty soon, I mean, if you do that a couple of times, this place is packed out. We, can't, we cannot fill it. It would be... Parking lot wouldn't even hold all the cars. Well, then what do you do? You know, I think you could run six or eight hundred people at this church. You say, you've got to be crazy. No, yeah, you could. As soon as we fill it up with 200, we add a second service. We fill that up to 200, that's 400. Once we get past the 400, what do we do? We start a third service. You say, when are you going to do that? Oh, Saturday night. We've got a Saturday night service. We fill that up to 200. You say, well, wait a minute. Now you're up to 600. Well, what do you do after that? Well, then we add a Sunday evening service, too. You fill that up to 200, you got 800. Do you realize how much this, this facility could be used to reach people? And that's what it's really about. It's not about maintenance of a building. You know, it takes the same amount of heat to heat this building, whether we do 800 or <laughs> we're going to do just the 200 or less, or 100. We need to fill it. Consider your time. All right, consider your time is my next point here. He says, in the fourth verse, is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses? Expensive inlaid wood inside their homes. Now, I, I couldn't find a paneled house from the Old Testament times because they're all long gone. So I found one of our panel houses from modern times. Now, I don't know that anybody in our congregation is living in a little shack like this. But, he says, look, you're living in your luxurious house while, he says, while 
My house is in the ruins. My house is in the ruins. It says, consider your priorities. What are your priorities? Then he gives this, he says, go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house. That is your job. And I put in the same manner, Jesus has said to us, go and make disciples of all nations. The temple today is the people of God. We know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You are the temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are. And so we need to go out and reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And as they come to know Jesus as Savior, they become one of us and the church grows and we grow he says go and make disciples of all nations that's why we sent the goods to Hungary they're there trying to make disciples of all nations that's why we do our outreaches here it's because we want to make disciples of all nations we are doing what we do and we have to reach out and that's that's the that's the commission here go and make disciples God blesses us from time to time people see our sign out front and they stop and they visit us we still need to go to them and receive them warmly and encourage them find out where they're at learn something about them share our faith with them if they know not Jesus that they might come to know Jesus every week it seems somebody trickles in our doors and do we go to them? I'm not talking about just going outside our church. Yeah, we need to do that. They're often right here in our church. Go make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them. In a couple weeks we'll be having a baptism here. We just completed baptism class today. But we're going to have, have a baptism here. But wouldn't it be great if we were having baptisms like every month? like every week wouldn't that be awesome that God was at work because we as a people were going and reaching and inviting other people to come and find faith in Christ consider your priorities the text goes on and says so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored Westminster Catechism says what is the chief end of man first question is to gl glorify God. That the answer is this. To glorify God. To bring honor to God. The second half of it is and to enjoy Him forever. You come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ and that's the beginning step of enjoying God forever. That is a beginning step of honoring Jesus Christ and, and, and God. God is pleased when people accept Christ as their Savior. That's what we should be about. Reaching people for Jesus. Building up in their most holy faith. Go and make disciples so that I may take pleasure in it. I want to challenge you right now to think of someone that you can invite to come to church with you. I'd like to pause until everybody has thought of someone, but I can't read your minds. He says, go up to the mountains. And he says, Ex consider your expectations. Oh, this is interesting. He said, listen, you expected much. You planted, you watered, you did everything. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. I want to tell you this. Little is much when God is in it. Psalm 37 says, greater is the little that a righteous man hath than the wealth of many wicked men. Little is much when God is in it. I'm going to tell you also, much is little when God is not in it. The key is getting God in it. Having Him pleased with it. Him delighting in us and in our, our work, in our ministry here. That is the key. He says, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. What? You mean the hole in my pocket? God, you put it there? Uh, you mean the fact that I'm never satisfied? God, you, you made me that way? Yeah, God said, listen, 
You expected much and it turned out to be little. You brought home whatever you brought home. I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord? Because my house, my house remains a ruin. Well, each of you is busy with his own house. I am so busy with my life and what I want, and what I do, my entertainment, my sports, my TV, uh, my kids, my family. You just name it. Uh, I'm so busy with me, me, me. And I forgot about you, you, you. I'm so preoccupied with myself that I'm not living with you. I'm not doing what you want me to do. Then he wanted them to build the temple. I don't think it's changed. He wants us to build the temple still, but he wants it with people, not brick and mortar. He wants us to reach people, people with the good news. Each of you is going about your own business. You, oh, I should have invited that person to church. Oh, I should have shared a Bible verse. Oh, I should have prayed for them. Why? I'm so preoccupied with me instead of being preoccupied with him. What that is is just wrong priorities. I've got my priorities all mixed up. As a Christian, it's Jesus first, others second, me third. I come in last place. That's what Jesus taught us. God first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then you come in last. That that's our Christian lifestyle. They had the wrong motives. Why? Here's what he says. All the things seem to be spinning the wheels, never satisfied. Life is just unfulfilling because of you. That's what he says. The heavens have withheld their dew and the earth the crops. God says, I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains. And on the grain and on the new one and the oil, whatever the ground produces, on the men, the cattle, and all the labors of your hand, everything you're doing, I'm against it. Boy, wouldn't you like to turn that around? Of course we would. Remember Luke chapter 12, uh, the Lord himself told us this story. He told us about the ground of a certain rich man that produced all kinds of great crops, and he thought to himself, whoa, man, what am I going to do? I have no place to store all my goods, my crops. I have so much. What am I going to, where can I reinvest? How can I, what am I going to do with all of this? Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones so I can hold everything I've got. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Hey, just relax, just chill. Eat, drink, be merry. Hey, party on, party on. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? What's he saying here? We need to be investing our lives in what really matters. What really matters. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. We need to be rich towards God. That only comes by putting him first, others second, ourselves third. So what can you do? The next part says consider your actions. Consider your actions. Then Zerubbabel, then Joshua... Then the whole remnant of the people, this is what they did, they obeyed. They obeyed. They just did it. They went up to the mountain, started chopping down trees. They started getting wood. They started building for the temple. We too must do the same. He says, go and make disciples. We have got to go and touch other people's lives. And so that they are provoked to ask us for the reason of hope that's within us and we share with them Jesus Christ is the solution to every problem they have in life. He's the one that brings purpose and direction, meaning to life. 
a fulfilling and satisfying life. You know it. When you are closest to God, you are most fulfilled. And when you are furthest from God, you are least fulfilled. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the people feared the Lord. Now this wasn't the sense, oh, I'm scared of God. This is the idea that they reverenced and they worshipped God. They had a fear, a reverential fear, a profound respect towards God. They loved the Lord at this point with all their heart. You see, they got their priorities right. They had the right priorities at this point. And God took notice. God notices what we do. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message, and the Lord said to the people, I am with you. I've got a question for you. When God's on your side, are you on the majority side or the minority side? You're the majority side. Come on, what can come up against you? I mean, he's your trump card. Man, you've you got the trump card. You, you, you win every time when the Lord's on your side. He said, I am with you. When the people revered God and did what God told them to do, the Lord said, I am with you. And that's what I want more than anything. I want to come to this place when we worship and sense that God is right here with us at Bethany. Don't you? I want to know that when I leave this place that God is with us as we go from here and we're touching other people's lives and, and they're looking at us and saying, I, there's something different about you. I don't know what it is. And you can say, well, you know what? I met Jesus and he changed my life. And what you're seeing that's different about me is Jesus Christ in my life. Whoa. So they start asking the reason of hope that lies within us and we begin to share our faith and that's exactly what the, the, God wants us to do. That's it. I'm with you. I'm with you. When God was with him, it says, so the Lord stirred up the spirit. Now, I, I didn't know how to show them stirring up a spirit because I've never seen a spirit. They're, they're actually invisible. But I, I got the heart here. God stirred up like a tornado. He stirred up the heart the hearts of Zerubbabel. Politics got its place in, in order. Wouldn't it be great if God stirred up our politicians so they did the right things? That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. He also st stirred up the heart of Joshua, the spiritual leader. Right? He goes on and he stirs up all the people. All the people. Listen, this is revival going on. Everyone is being touched by God. And they're, they're together, coming together and doing what God wants them to do. And I'm going to tell you, there's, there's great impact when a number of people get together as servants of the Most High God to do something for the glory of God. They came and they began to work on the house of the Lord God Almighty. They began to do what God had told them to do. You see what they did? They believed that God was actually with them and that God was going to use them. Do you really believe that? God is with me and he will really use me. Hmm. Well, it was on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius. If you remember when we started, it was the second year of King Darius on the first day of the sixth month. Same month, same year, first day, when you subtract that first one from that, 23 days later, they finally got it going. And I know what you're thinking. Why did they wait 23 days? Well, it took a little planning. I mean, they're going to build a building. They've got to have architectural plans. They've got to get supplies. And I think that's what's going on. They, they've already gone up. They're starting to collect the water, but they haven't actually begun on the actual work on the temple site because of all the preparation planning that took place. We've planned and we've prepared and all that kind of thing. We just need, you know, enough of the gospel already to go and share it with someone. The man that was born blind, Jesus healed him. They came to him and they said, how did this happen? He said, well, I don't know. This guy by the name of Jesus, uh, he spit on the ground, put the oil, 
mud on my eyes and told me to go wash. I washed and I could see. You see, he could already tell about Jesus. Every one of us here who knows Jesus has our story to tell how we came to find Jesus who took our spiritual blindness away and gave us spiritual sight. That's the story we tell. And say, come on, come to church with me. You'll find Jesus there too. Come, come to church and you'll have your, your spiritual blindness removed too. It took 23 days for them to get prepared. I think most of you are already prepared. All you got to do is reach out to somebody and share your faith with them. This is what I want you to take home with you today. We all need to consider our own ways. No one sitting next to us, my own. My circumstances, what is going on in my life? Where is my place in all of this? What role am I playing in all my circumstances and the way they are? And what am I really saying? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What do I really talk about all the time? If I have the abundance in my heart of Jesus, am I speaking about Jesus? Talking about Jesus? Praising Jesus? What I say really matters. I want you to take this home with you. What are you doing with your time? Well, you know, when, when I retire, then I'll have some time to spend more time in prayer. Uh, why not pray right now? What are you doing with your time? Your time. What are your expectations? You've been expecting and it hasn't been happening, so what do you, have you been lowering your expectations? Because, sure, you know, I, I don't want to ask for anything too big because I sure hate to make God look like he couldn't pull it off. What are your expectations? We serve a great God. What are you doing? What are you doing for the Lord? You see, when we do all this, and He will be with us, when we go about doing what He wants to do, He will be with us, He will be with us, He will be with us, He will be with you, He will be with me. And that's how we build for our future on our glorious past because in the past, the people at Bethany, they did the work of the Lord and it's time for us to do it too. Not just on what they have done. We've got to reach out to new people, reach them, invite them and bring them to our Savior. Will you think of one to invite to come with you next week? Will you do that?